Krista Callanan. I am 37 years old. For four and a half years now, been had my life flipped upside down um, with a condition called ME or myalgic encephalomyelitis. Um, that's also known as chronic fatigue syndrome, generally known by the population since probably about mid 80s in America, the CDC and their wisdom decided that they were going to start using the name chronic fatigue syndrome. And it trivialized ME. Fatigue is a symptom. Fatigue is not what this illness, um, it doesn't define this illness. ME affects people differently. It, it's very similar to conditions like, um, say, autism, where there's a spectrum of um, the illness. It affects people in a range of ways. Everything from mildly affected, um, someone that's generally able to go about their day do their their normal just really can't overdo it um, if they overdo it they'll end up spending a, a day or two or, or such um, so maybe only just a few hours really needing to rest um, that's the mild side of things I'm more in the moderate zone I'm able to work half of the week. I'm able to, if I'm lucky, um, a half day on a Monday, a full day on a Tuesday, and somewhere along the lines in the rest of the week, I'll try and pick up another half day to a full day. Uh, the rest of the week, I have to pretty much work around work. The Everything from socialising to appointments uh, all has to be planned out around my energy levels during my non-work days. If I can turn up to my work days, I'm good. <laughs> and um, If I can turn up to some social engagements, I'm doing really well. And when I say I have to plan around those days, I find I have to... If I know I've got a social engagement coming up or my work day is coming up, I'll need to have a rest that day before. Make sure that I don't have anything on the evening before. Um, same with after I've, I've been active socially, work-wise. Quite often I'll need to have a day rest after I've had my work days just to recover. I consider myself pretty lucky to be operating at 50%. At the far end of the spectrum, you're looking at people who've got severe ME. People who've got severe ME are completely bed bound. Uh, they might be exhausted just from trying to lift an arm, lift, a, lift their head off the pillow. Um, getting up to go to the toilet and that's their activity for the day. No, people don't know just how debilitating this illness is. The energy systems in your body are basically not functioning. 
they've, they've stopped working. You can eat, you can have food, which is usually turned into fuel by your body, but with, with ME, again, on a scale um, of, of mild, moderate, severe, you're not breaking down that food for energy. If, if your body isn't making energy properly, it, your, whole, your, your whole body, all of the systems in your body require energy to be able to operate. So you're looking at all the systems in your body not working properly. You're looking at um, digestive system. Um, that doesn't function properly. I don't absorb nutrients from food properly. Um, I, I miss out on... Uh, on a lot of the nutrients that we rely on for energy. Um, so that's probably a bit of a chicken or the egg is, is my, my um, digestive system affecting the energy or is it the energy that's affecting the digestive system? I don't know, but um, neurologically there's, there's issues. I, if I get too tired, I, yesterday I had trouble writing my name I had trouble holding a knife and fork because the dexterity the you the um, your extremities aren't functioning as well um, my tongue even I can start to have trouble talking um, I have trouble walking sometimes it feels like the muscles in my legs have turned to concrete like I often say I'm wearing concrete boots and walking through water it just feels like you're you're trying to move you're willing your body to move um, but the muscles just aren't responding your brain talking to to the to your muscles it's it's like there's a missing connection there somewhere along the way The version of POTS that very commonly comes along with ME is a hypervolemic. Hypo, not enough. Volemic, meaning not enough volume. So I'm not making enough blood. If you imagine a hose, that hose is full of water. If you blow up that hose, for instance, if I my body warms up slightly. Um, our body's natural cooling system, um, we um, vasodilate. Um, so if you have blown up that hose, you've still got the same volume of water in the hose, but all of a sudden you've got this extra space there, that pressure has dropped. That's effectively what's happening in my veins and my arteries with not enough blood, not enough of that volume there, the pressure has dropped. That means that, particularly when I'm upright, my body has problems with trying to pump the blood up to my brain. And that just exacerbates the neurosymptoms. It makes it very difficult to get clarity in your brain. You've got foggy brain, we, we, we call it. Um, that can be incredibly debilitating. Uh, all of a sudden I can't drive. Um, I, I wouldn't be safe <laughs> behind the wheel of a car because my judgment's gone. My, um, my ability to react has gone. I'm, I'm, it's like I'm looking through a cloud that's descended, a, a dark gray cloud that I can't see through to the other side of. One of those sorts of people that I couldn't sit still for two seconds, I would go looking for things to do. And I finished school, went to university, studied a Bachelor of Education, majoring in physical education. I was even going to be a phys ed teacher. Uh, I didn't end up being a phys ed teacher. I ended up just teaching the classroom, loved the kids. And I was still very active.
it was in, interesting to be in a committed relationship, living with partner, then get sick. That had quite an impact on the relationship. The, the relationship was probably strained um, quite a bit by my illness all of a sudden gone from um, being a partner that was quite active, going out, doing lots of things, being social, being um, active bike rides or long walks to suddenly being bed bound early days. The impact on that relationship was quite obvious. Um, it, it caused stress levels in the house to go up, my partner at the time was supposedly quitting smoking, but started smoking a great deal, uh, started drinking a great deal. Um, so 12 months into the ME, the relationship was over. It made things uh, incredibly difficult. So much so that I've not had a relationship since and I've got serious doubts about long-term relationships now. I, I, I want to stay positive and say that someone out there would be able to see me for who I am and see past the disability, see past me turning up to social engagements in my wheelchair, um, see past my failing brain and fogginess and no, tonight I need to stay and rest on the couch. Um, but part of me also accepts that the reality might be that someone can't accept that and this is my life now, uh, that um, it's too much to ask of someone to to take this on it's a lot to take on it also means saying goodbye perhaps to having kids I'm 37 now I'll be 38 uh, in a few weeks clock's ticking <laughs> I'm, I'm probably looking at giving up on one of the big dreams I've had in life where going back to the days where I coached basketball I I knew back then that I love kids and that I really want to have kids. Um, I think I'd be a really good mum. But look, if I'm lucky, I might get well enough that I can foster kids in the future. There's other ways of, of, of achieving that, I suppose. But me having kids, um, I don't even know physically I'd do well carrying a child and how on earth would you find the energy to give birth to a child? Um, what sort of life would I be giving that child if I can't run around with them and um, the pressure that that would then place on others around me and my family? Um, yeah, it's... So when I say that this has changed every aspect of my life, it's it's not only changed my day to day and being able to get up in the morning and 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 do things. It's changed everything right through to the future that I had planned for myself. I, I know that futures always don't turn out the way you want them to, but at least they can usually adjust, um, not turn into essentially no future. First of April 2013, I had pleuritic pain. I'd had pleurisy before, so I knew what pleuritic pain felt like in my lungs. Went to the doctors, had a chest x-ray done, everything was clear. Within a day or so of that, I got a cold, normal cough, cold, sort of um, thing that we deal with every winter, but 
thumbs for a week or, or two and then go. I was knocked out, yeah, probably about two weeks. And then I recovered to maybe 90% of, of my uh, uh, being well in full capacity. Then after a couple of weeks, I pretty much crashed again straight away. Another two to three weeks of cough, cold, being really unwell, thinking, well, I obviously didn't get over whatever bug I had before. It's stayed in my system or I've just been unlucky enough that my immune system's been affected and I've picked something else up. Okay, deal with that. A couple of weeks later of, of feeling better, having recovered from that second bout, I crashed again. So for a third time, I got a cough, cold, some sort of thing. At the time, because I was working so hard on my business, I was highly stressed. I had been pushing and pushing and pushing. So again, thought, well, okay, maybe the stress has really just affected my immune system. I'm run down. This is my body telling me, hey, time to slow down. Time to start listening to what my body's telling me. After that third hit of cough cold, the cough didn't actually go away. It just got worse. It stayed around and stayed around and stayed around till 13, 14 week mark. I'd seen an infectious diseases doctor. He decided that I had whooping cough or pertussis. He, even though all the tests were coming back negative that I didn't have whooping cough, apparently you can still get false negatives. And he was convinced I had pertussis. He ended up putting me into a hospital and on a nebulizer to try and stop this cough. I kept saying to him, I've got this underlying tiredness that's, that's there, that's kind of been there the whole way through that winter of, of getting sick and, and not completely getting better again. And then this cough, apparently with whooping cough, you cough and it's exhausting. But in between cough bouts, you should actually feel reasonably okay again. But I wasn't. I was absolutely exhausted, can't lift my head off the pillow. I'm starting to get other symptoms like the issues with heat. And obviously that was the, also the start of the POTS, not enough blood volume. Every time I'd have a shower, the heat of the shower was just too much for me to be able to stand. I was passing out in the shower. I was needing to sit on the floor of the shower because I couldn't stand with that heat. I was not getting enough oxygen to my brain. So I'd mentioned some of these things, but they pretty much got dismissed as you've got whooping cough, you're just really unwell, you shouldn't expect anything else of your body at this point, you just need to get over this cough. So finally we got rid of the cough and there was still this underlying tiredness. And I, again, mentioned it. I had my follow-up appointment with the infectious diseases doctor. And yes, we've got, managed to get rid of the whooping cough. But I'm still really tired. I can't get rid of this, this fatigue. And he said, you're probably just fighting some sort of virus still. Give your body time. Sometimes these things can take six months or so to clear your system completely. So... I gave it time. My GP at the time was fantastic. She kept saying to me, this one thing that I wish all doctors would say, okay, so we've got our tests, we've got these results, it's showing nothing. Every test that we do comes back as being within normal range and, and not showing up anything. But you're obviously feeling something, so what do you instinctively feel is going on? My doctor kept asking me that question because she was getting no clues at all from any of the tests. She didn't know where to go with, with what I was telling her. And I 
kept saying to her, well, there's this underlying tiredness that I'm really worried about. And eventually she mentioned chronic fatigue syndrome. She organised to send me to a professor that she knew who had apparently studied in the area of fibromyalgia and um, similar sorts of illnesses, which she was kind of bundling chronic fatigue in there with that, sent me to see this um, professor. And I'll never forget that day. It was summer, um, that six months or so after the winter that I'd first gotten sick. It was hot. I had to park my car a fair distance from the hospital and walk to the hospital. I was exhausted. I was ready to fall over because I was so faint and dizzy with not enough oxygen to my brain. And I've arrived really unwell at this appointment. And I remember feeling like this professor was judging me, like you're putting this on that me huffing and puffing and feeling dizzy and lightheaded and, and searching for a chair to sit down on and, and saying I'm just so fatigued trying to explain my experience to that point. And she did her, her checks. She did... The, her, her once over of checking my temperature and, and looking down my throat and you know, tapping on, on my stomach. And she said, sometimes people get a virus that takes a while to get over six months, even 12 months. And I've, I think that that's probably what you've got. You've mentioned chronic fatigue syndrome, but I don't believe in chronic fatigue syndrome. There is no such thing. It's just a random, all-encompassing explanation that people will often give to probably a group of different illnesses that, that can't be explained. What you need to do is go for a walk and you need to tell yourself that you're going to get better. I walked out of the office feeling like I was going mad that maybe this was in my head maybe my head was somehow making this up I couldn't quite see how that was possible but I couldn't this is a highly experienced research professor who's who's telling me that chronic fatigue doesn't actually chronic fatigue syndrome doesn't actually even exist and that I'm, I'm just getting over a virus. Time rolled on and I, I got to that 12 month mark and I'm thinking to myself, that research professor, when's this, when's this illness gonna finally finish itself off and, and leave? It never has. It's, I'm still waiting for that day <laughs> when that supposed 12 month virus <laughs> leaves my system and I can just go for a walk again. Um, a lot of people talk about this sort of experience in different, in, in, in different versions of the same story essentially, where they've been to a doctor, they've said, I'm really not well, I don't feel right, this is what's been going on. And you, it's almost like you're, you're looking into blank eyes, the person who's staring back at you, because they don't know what to do with you. They have been told that chronic fatigue syndrome doesn't exist. Most of them haven't heard of the proper name ME, myalgic encephalomyelitis. Most of them don't even know about a lot of the symptoms. I've mentioned POTS to a number of doctors and they have no idea about this postural orthostatic tachycardia where your body doesn't have enough blood volume. You 
you feel like, do I even exist? Do, am I being taken seriously? Am I just being dismissed because they don't know what to do with me? Are they, has all of their education to that point just dismissed this as psychosomatic? And that's where it becomes really scary because I found out later that in a lot of cases that is the situation. We face doctors who don't believe how serious the illness is and we're getting incredibly poor advice about, if any, certainly nothing that's of any consequence or effective in any way to actually be treated with. We've been forgotten about. Invisible illness is the term and there are a lot of different illnesses that do fall under that heading of invisible Ill illness. <coughs> Basically invisible illness means people who have a disability of some sort but it's not obvious to look at them. You look at me right now and you see a person who's babbling away, um, chatting for a long period of time with, you know, my, my, my face is, is expressive to a point. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to a point. <laughs> uh, I can get up and move around again to a point. Um, there are limitations there, but generally speaking, to look at me, you'd think that there was nothing wrong with me. That is invisible illness. I have a lot of restrictions placed on me by this illness and it's forever changing. Uh, mobility issues is a big one. I can, let's say I had to walk 100 metres. To start with, I would look fine. By the end of that 100 metres, I'd be probably crawling. I need a wheelchair to help me with things like shopping, food shopping. Um, I'd probably only make it walking one aisle of a shopping centre, um, the supermarket these days. Clothes shopping in a, in a, a large shopping centre. I need my wheelchair for that. Again, if it wasn't for that wheelchair, you wouldn't think that there was anything wrong with me if I was to just stand there. And, and that actually makes it quite amusing when you're in your wheelchair and then all of a sudden you get out of that wheelchair because everyone assumes if you're sitting in a wheelchair, your legs don't work. <laughs> um, so yes, you do get judged because of that invisible illness. I can arrive at the shopping centre, get out of my car and walk around to the back of my car to get my wheelchair out. And before anyone's actually seen the wheelchair, seen me get into the wheelchair, they're looking at you and thinking, well, you've got a wheelchair sticker on the car. You're walking fine. There's nothing wrong with you. And I've had people come up to me and abuse me because they've wondered what right I have to be parking in a disabled car space. They assume that perhaps I am there for someone else or that I'm cheating the, the system and I'm using someone else's sticker just to get the good car park near the, uh, nearer to the shops. Uh, you get judged based on what people see. They don't take the time to actually ask the question you've um, parked in a disabled car space, you know, do you need a hand with anything? Are you, you actually um, disabled in some way that I can provide assistance? No one's ever done that to me. I'll admit, I used to think the same. I had no idea about invisible illnesses or how prevalent invisible illness actually is. Um, 
the other thing that people don't see is the days that I can't get out of bed. They don't see me yesterday waking up about nine o'clock, having been awake till about 2, 3 a.m., thanks to insomnia with ME, I could hardly lift my head off the pillow. I'd just done too much in the days leading up to the day yesterday and my body had crashed. I was in pain. I, I couldn't hold a knife and fork. I couldn't write. I, everything in my body was just screaming at me that I've overdone it. That's post-exertional malaise. That's, I've done too much the day before. That is the hallmark symptom of ME, post-exertional malaise or PEM. Uh, PEM is the difference between I've been a little bit tired so I need to sit down and rest and my body has completely run out of energy and I'm gonna pay for it for several days. So, the other side of being an invisible illness is that on days where I'm suffering with PEM, you don't see me, I'm completely invisible. The people who have severe ME, they say around about 30% of people with ME are completely housebound or bedbound. That's 30% of us that are completely invisible. You don't see them at all. That was me at the beginning of the year before I made some slight improvements. Uh, but, and you can drift in and out of um, severity level. That's, that's the other side of invisible illness. It's, it's not just people looking at you and thinking there's nothing wrong with you. It's, you're not even there. For the first couple of years of having ME, I felt pretty alone. My world had closed right down to a few friends that hadn't forgotten about me. My beautiful parents, who I love very much and who are amazing, amazing people, very supportive and have believed me from the beginning. Believe, believe it or not, there are people who... <coughs> whose families don't even believe how sick they are. I had sent a message out on Facebook once my local GP had floated the idea that I had um, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, I'd floated it out on Facebook to friends and I got a couple of girls that I went to school with had said, I've got that too. So I knew of a couple of people out there that had ME I didn't have a clue just how many people out there had ME. It took me a few years, and with friends mentioning, you know, are there support groups that you could get involved with? And I'm thinking, you know, turning up to a, to a meeting somewhere and, and thinking to myself, my goodness, how am I going to have the energy to get myself up and out every week, once a week or once a month or something like that to go and meet with other people and what's that going to achieve? Other than feeling a little less alone, I guess. But then I got to a point where I started to read. I started reading online and trying to find out more about ME. I started reading research. I started following links from one thing to another to another. And I found connections to these support groups online, on Facebook. And all of a sudden, the ME world just completely opened up for me. I, I've joined a couple of groups both the ME, uh, ME CFS specific groups and also um, some POTS related groups as well because that's such a big problem for me. 
the uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia. Um, but yeah, the one particular Facebook group, uh, ME CFS Australia, so ME slash CFS Australia, has about 3,000 members in it at the moment. It's a closed group, so everyone who's in the group has to has to have a conversation with one of the admin and suggest they actually really do have ME or they're a carer, direct carer of someone that has ME. And then you find yourself in this safe, supportive, comforting little world where all of a sudden you don't feel alone at all. There there are people sharing very private stories, very private discussions about illness symptoms and experiences and even just day-to-day -day things that they want to share about what's going on in their lives. And it's a safe space to be able to open up. We've come together to help each other where help is almost non-existent in any other form out there. We're not, got, we're not getting any help from doctors. We're not getting any, any help from the government in terms of funding um, to help forward research. We're, we're left alone in so many ways, but at least we can be there for each other. activism. We have this big problem of government funding, of, of no one knowing that we're here. And although we're trapped in our bodies, we're trapped in our houses, we're trapped in so many ways, our voices collectively, we're starting to make a little bit of noise. <laughs> it's the craziest thing not having energy but trying to scream out and let people know that we're here that takes energy so where there's a lot of us at least we can back each other up and chip in and help each other out in different stages at different times it's, it's so often that will be on a, an, an activism path and contribute a little bit, then crash and you disappear and you see people online just suddenly disappear and you know they've gone into a crash. And sometimes that can be a few days, sometimes that can be a few weeks, sometimes that can be a few months or longer that they disappear. But we're backing each other up and helping each other to finally, as one voice, let everyone know that we're here. And the more we come together, the louder we can scream together. So, <laughs> it's, it's time for us to be heard. And we need more people not just people who are unwell, but we need people who are well to also come together and give us help. Um, there are other online groups, not just the support groups, but there's a group called ME Action. And there's a, an Australian branch of ME Action, ME Action Australia. And I would encourage anyone who has the thought, well, yes, I haven't heard of these people, something should be done, let's, let's do something, get onto ME Action and see what you can do. We need a lot more research to be done. One of the big problems is funding. We've been forgotten about and that's in all areas, including funding for research. Obviously, 
you don't get to a treatment, you don't get to a cure without first having research and finding what's behind this. What, are, what is going on in the body that means that we're not making energy properly? What's stopping that energy from being made properly? To give you an example of what we're facing in terms of problems with research funding, 2015 in Australia, the federal government in providing funding for research provided $9 million in funding research to MS. And for MS in Australia, there's around about 23,000 people. HIV, AIDS, federal government funding 14.9 million for around about 35,000 people in Australia with HIV, AIDS guesses of how many people with ME in Australia are around about 240,000 plus. We don't know how many people have ME until we have a diagnostic tool to actually count how many people are testing positive. We don't know how many people have ME. But the guesses at the moment are around about, the estimates at the moment are around about 250 or 240,000 plus in Australia. That's around about 1% of the population. Some say it could be as high as 2%, half a million people. In 2015, we received from the federal government $121,000 in funding for research. That's not much money for such a huge group of people. Since the year 2000, in total, ME has received from the federal government $1.6 million total in 17 years. Commensurate with the prevalence of this disease, we're forgotten again. <laughs> 